Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Doctor's Lounge. Always with myself, Dr. Madanaudin, and Dr. Sajal Ahmed. And today we've got a special guest with us, uh, Dr. Amir Raghuru. How are everyone doing? Hi. Good. 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 Uh, so this is the second part of our two-part series. Last time we had Dr. Alexis Manning on, talking about locum life. And today we've got Dr. Gangru, who is a partner, and we'll be exploring a little bit more about partnerships, the pitfalls, the benefits, uh, how things have been affected by COVID, and the future of partnerships going forward. And especially useful for the new GP registrars, who are yeah, perhaps yeah. thinking about whether they should become a locum or whether they should become a GP partner, what should they be doing? Should they be buying into a practice? Uh, do you have to buy into a practice? Things like that. So we'll have a chat with Amir. Yeah, we'll have a chat and uh, this is a chance to uh, sell to, to everybody but why, it, why to be a partner <laughs> rather than going into the, the dreaded dark side of locum life. <laughs> um, so before we start, uh, Dr. Gangul, if you could just tell us a bit more about yourself. Tell us about uh, where you're based and how long you've been doing what you've been doing. Assalamu alaikum Sajad and Namat. Thank you very much for inviting me and it's great to see you guys uh, doing this program, uh, Doctor's Lounge. So, uh, obviously as you know, uh, GP world is a variety of work, uh, locums, partnerships, salaried posts, sessional GPs, uh, they are uh, academic as well. So I've been a partner in Cardiff for now 10 years. So it's been a long time. So I was trained in uh, uh, GP training in Scotland. Then I moved here for a partnership. So when I was being trained at that time, your aim was to get a partnership. Mm -hmm. So that was the ultimate goal. And locums were looked down upon if you didn't have a partnership. Mm -hmm. But world changes, time changes, and here we go. We couldn't find partners anymore so so yeah it's i think it's uh, individual choice it's also uh, what you're interested in uh, how much responsibility what you want to take uh, a few a few weeks ago i was reading an article and somebody mentioned that you can uh, you cannot have a cake and eat as, as well so it's yeah. the same as for locums as well so they had good time but as uh, COVID affected all of us, uh, locums, I mean, uh, some of my friends were really struggling to find work and I do feel sorry for them. Uh, hope things get better and hope uh, we can help them out as soon as this is over. And Amir, uh, I, I, as, as far as I'm aware, you're also the lead for Cardiff, for the local medical committee. Yeah, so I, I have been a member of local medical committee uh, in Cardiff, uh, which is brought up. It uh, includes two health boards, Cardiff and Bay. Actually, three now. Bridgend is included as well. Mm -hmm. So, Kuntaf and uh, Cardiff and Bay. So, Bridgend is part of Kuntaf now. Mm -hmm. So, we are covering these three areas. And Mercer is part of Kuntaf now. So. So just to give us a bit of context, what do you do in an LMC for people who don't know or the so, GP registrar LMC, probably don't know? Yeah, people who want to go into LMC are people who are interested in medical politics, basically. So mm -hmm. you need to know what is your contract, how you need to negotiate your work with uh, secondary care. So you can call it that LMC is basically uh, a is levies levies paid by partners and in the in all the practices uh, pay a levy towards LMC and LMC then has got elections and their members are select uh, elected uh, and then they've got further elections through which the uh, like chair vice chair card uh, constituency leads are all elected as well and we have got uh, different meetings. We go to different boards where we uh, have representation of GPs, basically, and we try to negotiate our work. So, 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 so what you mean to say is that in the LMC, you've got representatives who are talking on your behalf. But yeah. who, who is allowed to vote? Is it any doctor or is it uh, only the LMC members or who is supposed to vote for you? 
to represent. So all, 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 I mean, LMC represents all the GPs basically. So LMC has got a sessional committee which uh, represents uh, locum and sessional GPs. Mm. Uh, LMC also represents salaried doctors. LMC represents partners as well. So every practice pays a levy. So if you can say that LMC is a representative body of GPs. Mm. Uh, so if you in a practice are having a problem, you would go to LMC. Right. Right. And you're negotiating your, you mean uh, the care with the secondary care is about for example. Yeah. So <laughs> you are nego Yeah. So if you if you were in a practice and you were getting work which was not supposed to be the GP work and it was unresourced work coming to you, then you would go to your LMC. L L mm -hmm. LMC would be your body to uh, question or, and negotiate your work mm -hmm. on your behalf, uh, any inappropriate, and give you advice, basically. So mm -hmm. uh, LMC is basically your advisory body as well and your representative body in uh, negotiating local enhanced services. And obviously, it also... Uh, is under the umbrella of GPC and BMA. So, you mm. know, uh, this, the BMA and GPC sits on top and then LMCs are local bodies. Mm. So I presume, I mean, with the partnerships then, um, especially during during COVID, uh, I'm talking about COVID again because it's the context of how things have changed. Yeah. Um, did LMC meetings carry on via Zoom or Skype or something? Or did yeah. You so business is continuing as normal, uh, but it's just become more virtual meetings remotely. And it actually, the involvement has become more now because we used to, the meetings which we used to have like uh, a quarterly meeting or two monthly meeting. Now in COVID peak time, we are meeting weekly as well with health board. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and there, there are other uh, meetings which LMC representatives go to and which are conducted by health board but LMC representation is there to uh, for GP representation basically. Mm -hmm. So those meetings were all carrying on. Uh, obviously the scenarios were different. We were using Zoom or mm -hmm. uh, uh, Microsoft Teams now as well. So I think I'll let Imad speak a little bit. <laughs> okay. I'm going to bring the conversation back a little bit to the partnership aspect. <clears throat> um, so before we begin, for those uh, GP trainees, GP registrars, doctors who are starting their GP careers, what's the the draw to a partnership? I know you said before when you were training, it was the sort of pinnacle of where you wanted to get to. But now you're there. What about your role as a partner, your responsibilities as a partner, do you think is attractive to the people coming into the profession at the moment? Yeah, I think uh, general practice depends on continuity of care. Hmm. That's the essential part of general practice. You can't leave, you can't say that without continuity you can run general practice. It can't happen. Uh, it's, if you take out the continuity factor, then you'll be essentially running an out of hours sort of a service where people will come and go and deal with one problem. Uh, as a partner or a salaried doctor, you're there all the time for your patient. Uh, so you're actually... Or as a long-term locum. <laughs> or long-term locum is also sort of a uh, salaried post, you can yeah. call it, isn't it? Yes. So, I mean, there, I mean in, in locum as well, there are different roles now, isn't it? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's uh, ad hoc then long term or you know even then there are like uh, uh, remote now remote uh, uh, triage roles have started as well so mm -hmm. so i i i mean partnership and salary post are a little bit different uh, partnership is more about business as well and plus you've got uh, from patient point of view you're doing the same work so as a salary doctor you'll be seeing seeing the same patients as a locum you're seeing the same patients but what you need to understand is general practice is a contract which is given to you and there are certain services you have to provide. And when you, uh, as an independent contractor, so it becomes your responsibility to employ your staff, to structure your practice, to pay your bills, to pay wages to all the staff. And 
how those income streams and expenses are managed it's partner's responsibility so either partner the clinical partners can have business input as well but uh, some of the practice managers uh, are very good at business uh, side of it so it depends on the structure of the practice so bigger the practice you would need somebody like a business manager mm. rather than a clinical mm. person because in a bigger practice you may not have time to deal with the business side as well in smaller practices you can find time and you can save a lot of money by actually doing some business work yourself as I a mean, clinical this person. is this is something like when i was doing the vts and i'm sure imad probably is the same we don't really get taught business skills in medical school neither in gp training no. so and i and i don't know the budgeting and how the money is coming in through yeah. uh i mean every practice is different but i presume you would be dealing with millions um how are you managing that i mean don't you get sort of cold sweats thinking you're going to lose the money yeah no i think you get used to it <laughs> you you get used to it obviously it's a responsibility and there there are a lot of liabilities as well that you take on when you take a partnership mm. um you have got staff you have to pay their wages mm. uh, you know boiler can break down suddenly and that's expenses come up mm. or you need to get a new toilet fitted so these kind of things you know are all part of my gp life so along with seeing copds diabetes sore throats fitting toilets <laughs> you know <laughs> these are all part of partner's role So you know I remember I remember one of the GPs he once said he wanted to do a plumbing course because that plumbing <laughs> would cost him a lot so it would be easier if he just did a course himself <laughs> I mean uh, me and my uh, GP partner uh, we we try to fix things ourselves in the surgery not long ago we put some tiles up on the you know uh, reception uh, so you know you you have to do certain things you can yeah uh, so it i enjoy a partnership because it gives you more empowerment it gives you more flexibility it's rewarding financially mm. uh and from clinic the biggest reward you get is the clinical work you do mm. so you develop that relationship with your patient because you think of it like a business so if you've got a shop and you want your customers coming back you'll always be nice to them isn't it and you'll sell good stuff to them yeah so general practice you have to sell good stuff to them and so how many salary doctors or locum would worry what is the list size of the practice you some of them will actually not even know what is the list size, the size as yeah. a partner your eye is always on the list size why is the list size going down why is it going up what can i do to make it better what services i am providing to my patients so sometimes you have to compromise a lot to benefit your patients mm. uh, financially as well so uh, uh, there are uh, laws of compliance and you know uh, with uh, premises compliance and stuff like that you have to spend money on to practice you can't actually it's it's your baby basically and you have to mm. look after it mm. mm-hmm. Uh, that brings me on to a, a interesting point as well. So, historically, when people have joined partnerships, they've had to put some money in to so buy into the partnership, buy into the business. Uh, there are a lot. Of, well, now it's changing slightly because some GP practices don't own their premises; is they're sort of renting or leasing. So there's no buy-in there. There's no investment. But from your own personal experience, how did you actually become a partner in the surgery you're working in today? Did you just jump into it or did you work there before or how did it what was that process so before buy in depends on before you actually answer the question i mean i mean i think one of the aspects of the same mm-hmm. the buying in i don't think it's on, not only dependent on the practice building it's also matters on liability so you've have to have some sort of money pool where yeah. if things were to go pear shaped and the practice would fold you would need to pay some money um salaries etc to the staff that would need to come from yeah. somewhere 
so the buying in even is not really structural anymore it is obviously you have to think about yeah. that there are certain factors which affect the uh, buy in uh, sort of thing so uh, you're right uh, going back everybody wanted a buy in so buy in is basically if you want to be part of the premises because the premises actually most of the premises are owned by the partners and then you get what you call is a notional rent for the building so it's a good investment so uh, if you buy a building in a in so, sort of a, you know say cardiff if you've got a building for 200 to 300000 pounds a small uh, uh, practice and then you get a notion rent for it so after even paying off the mortgage or the business loan you will still save money and it's a long term uh, mm. investment because nhs uh, nhs business is not going to go down so that that business is going to be there for long term and even if it goes down the biz- building belongs to you so it is uh, like a saving for you for your retirement as well mm. so what happens in uh partnership is if you got for example if you got four partners uh they they own own the building one partner is now retiring so he invested say 10000 pounds 20 years ago okay so building was 40000 pounds then now building is 200000 pounds so now his share in the property is 50000 pounds correct mm-hmm. so yes. the the outgoing partner needs to be paid off that share now obviously somebody needs to buy in his share either the remaining partners pay him off and get the share of the building and they divide the notion rent among themselves or the incoming partner becomes pa- partner in the building as well and he gets he pays 40000 for example he pays 50000 pounds that's paid off to the partner and he owns 50, uh, 25% of the property so suppose so they either have to have a mortgage or so mostly it's a it's a business loan and mm-hmm. i because it's an nhs business banks will give you a loan because they know it's a guaranteed income mm-hmm. so if you were to if you were to get a property a commercial property put it on lease you don't know whether your money is going to come every month or not mm. so you, but with with the nhs premises and G, gp premises it's a guaranteed income so mm. even if you're not a partner if you've got an option of investing <coughs> into a nhs premises as a pfi or something like that i would recommend you do that Mm. it's good as a long term investment and returns are quite good as well so a so for example on 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 a property around 300000 you can easily get nearly 2 uh, grand a month mm. back so you know you won't get that anywhere else no. in any business so mm. it's a it's a good investment as well so that was that's one way of being a partner in the property there are premises which are health board or the trust owned as well in those obviously as a, as a partner you pay a maintenance fee to the trust for maintaining the premises you, you don't get a rent for it uh, your bills are all paid by the health board or the or, uh, trust and you actually pay a maintenance fees every month to them even the phone in certain premises phones are also covered in the same then there is a third one called pfi private finance initiative where you actually lease it so whether the partners lease it or the health board leases it and the then health board or the partners are actually paying the rent to that company private uh, finance initiative company which holds the uh, premises so there are few options previously there was a buy in nowadays if you don't want to be a partner in the premises you can act, the partners existing partners can op, uh, offer you a partnership without being a partner in the premises so uh, like in my practice 
uh, when I joined, I was not the partner in the premises. But when my partners retired, they sold the building to me. And my, my, when my new partner came, he's not a partner in the premises yet. So, you know, the, the, there are options of buy-in. But buy-in is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. And mm -hmm. buy-in, you, you don't have to actually... Uh, you know, uh, worry about uh, banks not giving you loan or you have to have that money in the pocket. No, banks are easy enough because the paperwork is there. I it's suppose it'll, um, it'll also matter on where the building is. Because, yeah, exactly. You know, but like still, property prices. Yeah. 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 Still, the, the return that you'll get as an NHS business is much better than any anything else. Mm -hmm. So if if the building was, for example, in valleys even, the return on NHS business would be good. The investment, your investment would be lower than in Cardiff, isn't it? Mm. So obviously the, for some people, the buy-in may sound quite scary, 50,000 pounds, etc. as an initial thing. And at the moment, you find a lot of practices struggling to recruit partners. So maybe not so much in Cardiff, but if you go further afield into the valleys, there are lots of partnerships which are handing back their contracts or struggling to find partners to fill retired partners, or there are some partners who are even leaving practices and becoming locums. So from your point of view, what is the challenge at the moment uh, in terms of recruiting new partners? Is it the buy-in factor, is it, or is it a yeah. combination of things? Okay, to answer your question, let's go back maybe... 20 years, okay? 20 years ago, there was only one sort of uh, role, role. There was GP partners, yeah? And they occasionally had some doctors who were not, who had other commitments at home, they would work as salary, yeah? Then after, say, going back around 2008, uh, 2009, we had locum force started. That locum force actually is not, it, it didn't start, it started because the partners were not giving up partnerships. Mm. So I'll, I'll give you just my story. In 2008, when I trained in Scotland as a GP, I was hoping that I would get a partnership in, in local area and I would, you know, I had a, bought a house there. But it was so difficult to get a partnership that I had to move down to Cardiff. And then I got a partnership here. It took me a few years to, uh, you know, settle down. But at that time, the locum force was, everybody was kind of, you know, starting. Uh, I think, Sajad, you did your GP training around about same time. You would remember, isn't yeah. it? So that actually flared the whole situation up. And down the line from two, three years down the line from then, we saw that we confused our trainees which were newly coming out that what do you want to do you want to do a locum you want to be salaried so you you created more roles and you actually confuse them and then obviously uh, people were not confident enough to take partnership in that confusion because they were worried that maybe the scenario is changing maybe uh, government is going to create a all salaried contract role and we'll end up with liabilities but that wasn't happening. It's not that easy. It not, it's not going to change suddenly like that. You know, uh, government will uh, back you up. They have given you a contract. So we have to trust the profession. We can't just say that, okay, partnerships are going to disappear and it would be all set. It's, this is a story I've been hearing for last 15 years in general practice, but it hasn't happened. 60% uh, of the workforce of UK has become sessional or salaried or local. So partnerships have gone down. Uh, in COVID, we'll, uh, obviously, you never know what time will show, but COVID changed the scenario completely. You we, People are able to employ salaried posts where there were like one or two applicants for a salary post, now there are 20, 25 applicants for a salary post. Mm -hmm. So yeah, things are uh, never same, but what has stayed all this time is a partnership. 
that hasn't gone away and uh, with the investments that have been made by government in last few years uh, it's very uh, it's made the independent contract more robust uh, you can see how they are working as clusters the money is invested into clusters money is being invested directly into practices uh, partnership premiums have been offered in, instead of seniority, which is which is great. You know, you get like nearly eight thousand pounds a year for just as, as a new partner. You get eight thousand pounds a year, which increases over a period of time and maximizes to nine thousand six hundred pounds after I think fifteen years of service. So yeah, so there are more incentives in partnership, and partnerships are more rewarding, but. They do come with their pros and cons, which is obviously uh, business aspect, liabilities. Uh, but I don't think those liabilities are something you need to worry about before even taking a partnership. You see, you only worry about it after taking a partnership. Thanks for that. Yeah. So, so uh, no, no, no. I think let's let's talk about uh, very nicely about the COVID and how the COVID situation has obviously it's affected everybody. Tell us what effects if it has had on partners or pressures, because in the news we are seeing you know GP practices facing backlash if you don't see patients face to face, and the government is giving a staunch warning to the GPs to open up their practices and. The a &E consultant we talked about previously as well is saying uh, the GP practices were shut during COVID-19 and the testing fiasco and they're saying maybe GPs should be doing the testing for the COVID-19. So give us a little bit of insight of that um, yeah. aspect of things, how things have been going on. So I mean, uh, till March, uh, obviously, since March, we have been dealing with COVID. We are six months down the line and we still don't know what to do. That's the reality of it. Every day is uh, uncertainty. Every day is new things coming out. Uh, I've, when I go to these meetings, there are people high up from Welsh government, health boards in them, and they still don't know what we are dealing with, how are we going to progress. Last six months have been tough in a way that we have not even closed for a day. Mm -hmm. uh, most of us have not even taken leaves. Yeah. Uh, so what news and media show us is not the reality. So there was a very good article, uh, I think, a couple of days ago by Ian Harris, one of the GPs. You must have read it. Uh, the Bridgen. Uh, yeah, yeah, Bridgen yeah. GP. He's also in uh, GPC. He's also in uh, LMC as well. Yeah. And he he nicely described, you know, a non busy day of a GP. So if you if you've not read it, uh, go on to BMJ and it's worth reading it. I'll put it in the link. Yeah, I, I, I'll send you the link yeah. if you don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. I think uh, compared to, I mean, people were scared coming out initially. So we were trying to see how we are going to work on chronic disease because, you know, uh, acute care is something we do provide, but that is not our bread and butter. Mm -hmm. That is just something that we have to do. But the, the income that comes into general practice is through chronic disease management, working through our local enhanced services, direct enhanced services. So there are different uh, income streams which we have to manage by doing the clinical work. So if you are not actually doing those clinical work, you'll not be paid. Mm. So uh, lucky for us that Welsh government suspended most of the enhanced services, but we still had to provide most of the enhanced services. There was. Uh, We've got nursing home or care home and hand service, which you ha still have to look after those patients. Uh, you still have to give warfarin uh, dosing. You still have to do mm -hmm. INRs. You still have to, to uh, st uh, initiate uh, DOAX or NOAX. Mm -hmm. So there are, uh, you still have to give, uh, uh, you know, uh, hormone injections uh, like Prostab, Zolodex to prostate 
cancer patients. So uh, you still have to do dressings, you see, B12. So there's a lot of work which was still going on. And mm -hmm. you can't actually do this work without seeing patients. So GP practice you actually yeah. open. So this, this is the work. So not seeing a sore throat or a cough is, is not my worry. Yeah. But not seeing a diabetic for six months is more worrying. Not seeing a heart failure patient for six months is more worrying because they're going to deteriorate. Mm. So we had to find ways on how to co manage. contact those patients, how to manage those patients, how to do bloods, how to manage, uh, how to read the results and then convey to the uh, patients, how to change medications. So we adapted. We, uh, in the peak time, we did uh, have some in our cluster we tried to do some acute uh, clinics as well like hot clinics and cold clinics you can call them uh, there was uh, we but most of the things we didn't actually we planned but we didn't need it to you know uh, practically do them because we didn't actually hit that kind of environment which we mm -hmm. were hoping but uh, you know luckily the covid did not affect us that way Mm -hmm. But now, uh, last couple of weeks, it's uh, become quite crazy in practices. Uh, this uh, I'm also the MDT lead for my area. So in my cluster, we've got MDTs, so multidisciplinary teams. And uh, those every, every two weeks we do them, they are being done virtually now. So every practice I was, every GP was complaining of the same. There are like hundreds of triage calls every day and you still have to go through them then see some of them yeah. uh, if i go back six months i did two hours clinic in the morning then obviously looked at my results looked at the letters uh, signed my prescriptions had a coffee break uh, then one or two visits if i had to then came back had lunch Mm -hmm. Then started my afternoon clinic. Now, when I go into the work, or even if I'm working from home, there's a list. Yeah, I I don't get up from in front of my computer for like three to four hours because continuously you try to call one person, four more get added onto your list. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's crazy at the moment, uh, but we are seeing patients. We are open. We are are actually more worried about our patients who are not contacting us rather than who are contacting, contacting. us. We are worried about well, the chronic the, disease patients, the cancer patients. Well, this is my argument is at the moment is probably the best time for the patient uh, to be able to get to the GP. Because I, I, the practice I'm working in as well as a, as a long-term locum, we're having plenty of triage lists and everyone gets, whoever, whoever calls the surgery in the day, will normally get a phone call back on the same day. Whereas before, if they had a routine problem, yeah. if they booked in, it could be two, three weeks down the line you're seeing it. Yeah. But at the moment, we're dealing with everything on the same day. Yeah. Patients are calling in, they're getting dealt with the same day. So from a, a patient and a patient access point of view, I think it's never been a better time. You can, you can get to the GP by a phone, by email, yeah. by e-consult, by a video consult. Yeah. And if the GP needs to see you, he'll get you in to see you as well. Yeah. Whereas before that wasn't the case. So for government to turn around and, and say to us, the GP, you should be seeing patients. It was in fact, we're probably seeing more patients now, or dealing with more patients now than we ever have. It was an unfair comment, I would say, by the government. I think that was just political. Uh, they know GPs are working hard. They know, but I think that was just a, a political fiasco they tried to create. Uh, mm. I mean... We uh, we are dealing with more encounters every day than ever, and patients. There's no waiting list. There's no uh, patients are getting, uh, you know, uh, results on the same day of their call or the next day maximum. So there's no. Obviously, we have to adapt now because we we can't actually physically deal with the workload. So we have to actually adapt and. A limit to what we can actually safely do as well. Uh, so 
we have tried to now uh, you know prioritize cause in a routine and urgent manner in our surgeries so hopefully we'll see you know, over next few weeks the routine appointments will start getting booked up and then it would be same like you you'll get a routine call because there's so much work every day you can't actually physically deal with it and uh, we'll be soon dealing with winter pressure it would be a totally different ball game there we go it's um <clears throat> i think it's been a very very nice discussion with you amir and thank you very much for coming along um just just before we finish though, i want to finish on one point you know is that's okay sorry to interrupt one thing obviously we've seen because of the covid is, is everything has changed the game has changed completely for everyone locum salaried and partners obviously just in terms of interest of time if you can give a, a succinct answer what does the future hold now for general practice as a partner and partnerships and attracting people into partnerships and moving forward from a partnership point of view i mean there's always a role of every role in partnership you need to understand that so, uh, as a partner you would always need somebody to cover you when you're on holidays uh, you always need salary doctors as well because there has to be flexibility in the profession um, general practice depends on independent contractor status and i don't see that going anywhere so partnerships have become more stronger in recent time and covid has made it more stronger because at, at least it provides you security with income uh, and uh, uh, your work uh, with uh, salaried role is same as well i don't see salaried is different from partnership except for the duties are different but you are it's a substantive job rather than just a ad hoc locum so yeah i i think the locums are not going to disappear locums we need locums they do help us out and they have a role to play but if if everybody becomes locum then there would be nobody to give you a job that's what we need to understand <laughs> you, uh, not everybody can be a locum mm. yeah. <laughs> very nice to put <laughs> anything else i yeah. know uh, i think i think that's a nice nice yeah. uh, nice message to end on as well <laughs> Yes, I was just thinking that it was a very, very nice uh, discussion with Amir today. And to be honest, if we carried on, we just probably carry on. The podcast would <laughs> it's never be a story. It's never so I was story. thinking maybe it would be a good idea to have Amir again. Yeah. At yeah. some point, maybe have some feedback from uh, the viewers, the listeners. Anybody who's got questions about partnerships, put them down. You know, as always, subscribe, like, share. And hopefully we'll see you next time when Amir comes and joins us. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.